For the example today, I'm going to walk you through the process of adding annotations to plots um, using both geom text and geom label and geom label repel, repel um, but also with the annotate function where we can add our own arbitrary geoms, um, we can add text, we can add arrows, we can add rectangles, we can add whatever we want. Um, to make this go faster, and because it's a little bit more complicated, um, making the, the underlying plot, um, mostly because all I really want to focus on is how to add the annotations, not how to make the actual underlying plot. Um, I'm going to be copying and pasting from the code that's on the course website, and then just running that here, and I, I'll walk you through line by line what is happening. Um, so the example for the, the class that's on the website, that's going to be the most helpful. Um, this video is mostly just walking you through and explaining what everything is doing. So it, it should go a lot faster. So what we're going to do is, um, as always, we're going to switch to RStudio. We're going to create a new project. Um, just to get you into the habit of doing this here, we're going to start a new directory a new project, and we're going to just call this one annotations, and we'll put it on the desktop and create project. And so it should open up a new project that is pointed at um, that new folder that we made. What we're going to do here is we're going to use data from the World Bank again, just like we did um, in the uh, comparisons example so that we can just download the data directly from the internet and start showing some cool trends. So um, if you go to the course website, I'm just going to grab this code here. We're going to go to File, New, our Markdown file. Um, just hit OK. And we can select from here all the way down and delete and shrink this down. And we should be good to go. Let me close a couple of these R Studios. See if that will speed things up here. Okay, so I'm going to paste this in here. Um, so here we're just loading a whole bunch of libraries, and then we're going to get data from the internet. Um, these are our standard libraries with Tidyverse. Um, the WDI package lets us get stuff from the World Bank. Scales, I load, I, I can't remember if I actually use it in here, but it's there just in case we need to use something like dollar. GG Repel lets us use labels and text and make sure that they don't overlap with each other. And then this final package that I'm loading is called GG Text. Um, it's a newer package, it's not on CRAN yet, but it lets you do fancier things with text. Like if you want to have italics in the middle of your plot title, you can actually do that. Um, you can change colors in the middle of your, your subtitles or your captions or anywhere. Um, you can do all sorts of cool um, text formatting using this GG text package. You have to install it using um, a special command to install it from GitHub. Um, and so you can't just use the packages panel, but it's a cool thing. You should check it out. Um, so we're going to make a list of indicators that we want to get from the World Bank. These codes came from the URL at the World Bank website, and I just copied and pasted them here. We're going to get all countries um, with population, CO2 em emissions, and GDP per capita um, from 1995 to 2015. And so that is chugging along here. While that goes, I'm going to grab the code that cleans it. Oh, there it goes. So if we come here and look at WDI raw, here is all of the data. It includes countries that aren't really countries like the Arab world and the whole world and East Africa and the Pacific. So we want to get rid of those. We also want to rename some of those columns so that we're not working with columns like EN, ATM, CO2, EPC, whatever that means. So if we come down, we'll add a new chunk. And here is the code for cleaning the data. All that's really happening here is we're getting rid of the aggregates, which were things like the Arab world and the whole Southeast and Pacific. Um, and then we're renaming some of the columns. So we have population and CO2 emissions and GDP per capita, and then keeping some of these other columns here. So now if we look at WDI clean, we should have a much nicer data set um, that's easier to work with, nice clean column names, and that's great. Okay, so what we're gonna do now what we want to show is we want to compare, we want to calculate the rankings of countries on how well or 
like the, the size of their CO2 emissions. If a country is ranked number one, they're going to be the lowest emitters. They're gonna be the best emitters for that year. If they're ranked like number 198 or something, that means they're the worst emitters. They emit the most CO2. Um, so what we wanna do is figure out the rankings of CO2 emissions for um, 1995 and for 2014. That's the most recent year of CO2 emission data that we have, it doesn't include 2015. So that's, that's what we're gonna do. Um, let me insert this chunk. Um, if you look at the course website, the code for this is actually fairly long and involved, but I'm gonna walk you through each step so you can see what is actually happening here. Let's make it a little bit wider so you can see. And this actually helps you, it, it's good practice for debugging these pipelines because I could just hit command enter and it'll do all of these steps, but you don't know necessarily what's happening at each step. So one thing you can do is if you select from, like if we just want this first, uh, this first filter function, if I select from the end of that and go up to the top and I don't include that, that trailing pipe there, and then if I hit command enter or control enter, it will only run from here down to the end of the selection. So really it's just saying run these first two lines here. So if I do command enter, we should have a data set called CO2 rankings. And what we've done is we've gotten rid of all of the countries that have populations that are less than 200,000 people. Um, so we're only keeping rows where population is greater than 2,000. And so that gets rid of little countries um, because we're gonna be plotting um, a whole bunch of countries. And also like little countries, we don't want to rank them by their CO2 em emissions because if you have a country like Palau or Nauru, it's not comparable to like um, even other smaller countries like Bahrain or giant countries like China, like we're not gonna try to compare those. So we're gonna get rid of the small countries. We only want to look at data for two years, 1995 and 2014. So the second filter is going to do that. So if we select there and go up, now we should have CO2 rankings, but only for 1995 and 2014 for all of these countries. So it is significantly smaller now. We only have 355 rows um, and we can see that we have all of the data here still. And if we look at the CO2 emissions column, most of that data is here. One trick is if you sort that column and then scroll all the way to the end, that's where it puts the missing values. And so like Kosovo has no CO2 emission data at all. Um, South Sudan doesn't have any emission data in 1995 It's because it didn't exist in 1995. Um, so we, what we wanna do is get rid of these missing values because we're trying to compare um, between like 1985 and 2014 and we need two data points to make that comparison. So we wanna get rid of all of these rows that are missing. So if we come back to the code, that's what this function does here. It will drop all of the missing values in the CO2 emissions uh, column. So now if we run it, we're down to 344 rows it got rid of those, those missing ones that were at the bottom there. So that's good. Um, these next three lines, what we're going to do is we're going to group by year, which means it will take this data set and split it into two data sets. It'll take all of the 1995 rows and all of the 2014 rows and have them be as separate data sets. And then we're going to mutate and we're gonna add a new column to each of those smaller data sets that will rank um, each row by its CO2 emissions. And so the countries with the lowest emissions will have a one, and the, or the country with the absolute lowest will have a one, and the country with the highest emission will have whatever the number of rows is in that data set, 160 or something. Um, so that's what's happening there. And then we ungroup it to bring those two invisible data sets back together. And then anything we do after that will happen on the entire data set instead of the, the two separate ones. So if we select from ungroup all the way up to CO2 rankings, and then we look at CO2 rankings, um, it looks the same unless we scroll all the way to the edge, and then we can see that we have a ranking column. And that is for that specific year. So if we sort this, we should have two number ones and two number twos. That's because we have a number one for 1995 and a number one for uh, 2014. So let's see who it was. It's Burundi and Chad were the best countries for CO2 emissions, um, in part because they don't have massive factories like China and India, um, and so they have very low emissions. Um, we can see which countries are the worst if we reverse this. 
Um, it is uh, Qatar and Kuwait and Bahrain and UAE, which makes sense because they're making all of the oil. Um, so the, Saudi Arabia, they're kind of all the worst at emitting stuff. The United States, we're pretty down on that ranking. Um, I think we even beat uh, Canada's up there. China's in there somewhere. Um, and India's in there somewhere. But that's like these are the worst countries for CO2 emissions. So that's what's happening there. This next line, what we're going to do is simplify this data even more so that we just have a, a few of the columns. We want that ranking column, and then we want some of the general country information columns. So if we look at it now, um, we've gotten rid of population. Um, we've gotten rid of other stuff there. Um, so we just have the ranking. We don't even have the CO2 emission levels anymore because all we care about is the ranking and then the, the country information there. This next thing is the most complicated part of this whole uh, pipeline here. This is going to make it so that our data is tidy or is anti-tidy. Right now it is tidy. Um, we have everything duplicated. So we have UAE has its own row for 1995 and its own row for 2014. And then we have the ranking values there. That's tidy data. What we want is to make this untidy. We want a column for the ranking in 1995 and a column for the ranking in 2014 because we want to plot those two separate columns on the x-axis and the y-axis. And so we need to untidy this thing and make it wider. Um, and the way we do that is with the pivot wider function. If you remember from the RStudio primers, um, you played with a function called spread that was the reverse of gather. So gather took a whole bunch of columns and made it, long, made it a long data set and then spread moved those back out. Um, that's what pivot wider does. It's the more modern version of spread. So what it's going to do is it's going to make column names based on our year column. So it's going to look at our year column and it's going to say we need to make a column for every one of these values in here. So a column for 1995 and a column for 2014. And then we're going to add um, a prefix to all of those. And so instead of the column actually being named 2014, it's going to be named rank underscore 2014. And then the values for each of those columns is going to come from our ranking column. So what it's going to do is it's going to find, it's going to make a column for 1995 and one for 2014. It's going to prefix it with name. And then it's going to take that 167 and put that in the 1995 column. And it's going to take the 171 and put that in the 2014 column. And then we should have two columns in the end, one for each of those years. So if we select from there up to CO2 rankings and run it. And we look at it now, we only have 176 rows. And um, there it is. We don't have a column for year anymore because we've brought that up to here. So now we have a column for rank for 1995 and a rank for 2014. And this is helpful because now, one, we can plot these two different ranks, but we can also do math on these ranks. We can figure out which countries had the biggest jumps in rankings or the biggest drops in rankings between um, or over that 20 year time period. And that's what we do here. We're going to make a new column called rank diff, where it's going to take whatever the ranking was in 2014 and subtract it or subtract their 1995 rank. And that will show how much of a change there was between those two time periods. So if we scroll up and select there and run it, and we look at CO2 rankings, now we have a new column called rank diff. So some countries didn't really move at all. Angola here, um, over the past 20 years, it's stayed like at 60th place, basically. Um, some other countries have moved a lot. Um, Afghanistan, they were doing great in 1995, and they got a little bit worse in, 20, in 2014. That's not because like they're, they're, they're polluting more. It's because there's more industrialization, there's more development. So it's not like it's bad um, to emit more. It is, well, it's bad for like climate change. Um, the ultimate goal is to not have every country be like Burundi here um, or Chad. Um, it's to be able to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so that's like, we can see the progress there. If we sort by this rank diff column, we can actually see which countries changed the most over this time period. Um, so Moldova, they in 1995 were pretty bad. Um, down in the 100th place, and by 2014, they moved up to the 70th place. So they're moving up in the rankings, and they had the biggest jump um, out of any countries. Um, and then you can see some others. So like Belize, they moved from 84 to 64. 
Um, Ukraine moved from 141 to 121, so that's neat. If we reverse this, we can see which countries did the worst. Um, Equatorial Guinea was 33rd in 1995, and then they became 118th. Um, China, they had a massive uh, uh, push for industrialization, and they have thousands of new factories over the past 20 years, and that's reflected in their rankings here. They were in uh, 92nd place, now they're in 143rd place, and so that's a huge jump there. Mongolia as well, Iran, Vietnam, Georgia, the country. Um, so you can see which countries are kind of moving faster up the rankings. So we have that data now. One issue there is some of these might be missing um, because we're missing data from 1995 or from 2014 in the case of Eritrea. So we want to get rid of these rows where the, the difference in rankings is, miss is missing. So we can once again use our drop an A function here to get rid of those missing rows. So if we scroll up and run that, now we should have nice clean data here with no missing values um, and everything's in there. Um, the last thing we do here is we're gonna add two more columns um, because what we wanna do is we want to plot all of these countries and compare their rankings across these two years but we wanna highlight specific countries. We wanna highlight the countries that had the biggest changes, um, either positive or negative. So that's what's happening here. We're making a new column that I call big change, um, and we're using if else to make that. And so what we're saying is if that difference in ranking is bigger than 25, then we'll consider that a big change. Um, so if we look back here and sort this, that's gonna include countries like uh, Moldova and Zimbabwe and Den or not quite Denmark. It's going to include Syria and Moldova um, from the negative side, and it's going to include Equatorial Guinea and Bosnia and China and Mongolia, etc. But it won't include like Turkmenistan. It was only 21. So that's what's happening here. We're making that new column that's just indicating that they had a big change. I chose 25 just arbitrarily. Again, this is not like actual analysis. If I was a real environmental scientist, like um, I'd be more concerned about the data quality. I'd be more concerned about um, the methodology behind looking at rankings. Um, it's kind of fraught because if you are a country who's doing really great and you're doing all sorts of um, emission cutting measures um, and then other countries are doing that as well and do it slightly better, then you're going to go down in the rankings even though you're doing a great job um, because only like one country can be number one. And so if a whole bunch of countries are like acting like number one, um, it's going to push everybody down. So just because you move down in the rankings doesn't mean it's bad. Um, it's just, that's just the nature of these rankings here. Um, this last mutate is a fancier version of this if else statement. So with if else, you have to give it a test and then you say what happens if the test is true and what happens if the test is false. But if you have multiple conditions, um, then it gets really complicated because technically you could uh, nest things in here. You could say, if this test is true, then do another test. And if that test is true, then do something else. Um, so this case when function is basically a fancier version of if else that lets us combine all of that into one statement here. So what we're saying here is if that difference is less than negative 25, then that means their rank improved. If the difference is greater than 25, that means the rank worsened. And if it's anything else, um, so greater or less than 25 and greater than negative 25, then we'll just call that rank changed a little bit. So they moved just a couple spots in the rankings. So all we really care about are these two here, rankings improving and rankings worsening by that big amount. So if we run this whole thing now, we should have a data set that looks like this. We have the rank column for 95, for 2014, the difference in rankings, and then this indicator variable marking if it was a big change, and then this is the type of change it was. So now we have some columns we can work with, we can start plotting. And that's where we get into the annotations here. So the plot, the basic plot, we will just do these first two lines here. So we're going to plot that CO2 rankings data here. We're going to put 1995 on the x-axis, and we're going to put 2014 on the y-axis. Um, 
and we're going to color these points by what kind of change they had. So we should have three different colors in the end. So if we hit play and we look at the plot that it makes, there we go. So, and we added this reference line here. So that just means like if their rank was exactly the same between 1995 and 2014, then they should be on that line. So if you look at these green points, for instance, these are the ones that improved. So whatever country this is, they were near 100th place in 1995, but in 2014, they were in 60th place. So that was a big change. And so any dots that are down in this triangle improved. Any dots that are up in this triangle got worse. So whatever country this is, they were in like 30th place in 1995, but then in 2014, they were like in 120th place. China is one of these dots. Um, we can't really tell what all the dots are because nothing's labeled, but that's kind of the intuition behind this plot is this corner got better, this corner got worse. So that's what we want to illustrate um, with our um, plot. And so we want to add all sorts of annotations here to help the reader understand what's going on in each of these corners and what these points are. So first we can label some of these points. Um, we specifically only want to label the blue points and the green points here. We don't want to add labels for all of the, the countries that kind of made little changes. We just want to highlight the ones that had big changes. So we're going to use geom label repel for that. We're going to feed it a new data set or a, a separate data set that is a filtered version of our CO2 rankings where it's only going to keep the rows where big change is true. And then it's, so it's only going to add labels for the blue dots and the green dots. And so it's going to label it with country. It's going to fill it with um, the, that color as well. And then it's going to have white text. And for best practice, we're going to set a seed so that the labels are in the same place every time. So we'll say seed equals one, two, three, four. So now if we run it, we should get a whole bunch of labels that look like that. Cool. So we have Syria and Moldova that improved, and we have all these other countries that didn't improve. And we can already see some issues happening here. Um, we have five different colors showing up here. We have this red, we have this slightly different shade of red, we have turquoise, we have green, and we have blue. Um, we want them to all be the same. We want these labels to be whatever green color we use there. And we want these turquoise labels to match that blue there. And we want to kind of de-emphasize those red points there. We don't care about them as much. So what we can do is add some scale layers to change the colors of both the fill and the um, color. So we're just going to add a plus sign here. These colors right here are just colors I found through the Google um, color picker um, that are, I think, can I remember what they are? If we plot them, we can see what they are. Um, there it goes. It's blue and red and gray. So the countries that got worse, I coded as red. And then the countries that got better, I coded as blue. Notice how in scale color manual, I had to feed it three different colors. That's because there are three different values here. We have the rank, rank changed a little bit. But in the fill, I only had to feed it two manual colors because we don't have a fill for that gray. Um, we're only filling by, like we're only plotting these countries that got worse and got better. So we only had to feed two different values there. So now we have a good plot that we can start working with and we can start annotating. So this is where we start getting into all sorts of fun things. Um, one thing we want to do is to help the reader interpret this thing. We want to put some text down in this bottom corner that says countries down here are improving and countries up here are worsening. So to do that, we are going to use the annotate function. And this is the official fancy annotate function here. We'll get both of them um, with all of the, the fancy settings that I added to it, but we'll walk through what they do. So we have this annotate function. We're plotting it as text, and then we have to specify where exactly on the plot it is going. So I want the outliers improving label to show up at x equals 170. The way I got that number is I looked at the plot and I said, this looks like about 170. I want the label there. And then the y is going to be six, which is not quite at zero. I wanted it up a little bit, so it's not like right on top of the line there. So that's, it's gonna put a label down there. The text it's gonna use is this outliers improving. Um, I told it to be italic and light gray. And this hjust argument 
controls the horizontal adjustment. If it's zero, it's going to be left aligned. If it's one, it's going to be right aligned. So I want it to be right aligned. So the end of the text is right here at the end, and then it kind of comes inward. Um, and so if we run both of these, you'll see we should have text directly on the plot now, where we say outliers improving down here, outliers worsening up there. And that's pretty cool. Um, for the sake of repetition, I actually just inverted the X and the Y um, for the outliers worsening. So it's two points over and 170 up. So they're pretty much exactly mirrored there. And so now we have annotations directly on the graph, which is pretty cool. Um, so another thing we can do is we can add some other things here. To make it even easier for, th for the reader to see, because this ranking system, the way it's set up is one means you have the least emissions, and 170, 168 um, means you have the most emissions. So if we can somehow point that out as well, and potentially draw a box around this section and a box around this section and say, these are the, the countries that are emitting the least, and these are the countries that are emitting the most, then it'll help with the interpretation of the graph. So to do that, we're going to add some rectangles. So instead of text, we can also um, include geomrect um, to add rectangles. And so that's what this looks like here. So this first annotation, we're going to use a rectangle. We have to specify four numbers to draw this rectangle. The minute, like the beginning of the X, um, and then the end of the X, and the beginning of the Y, and the end of the Y. And so it's the four corners of this rectangle here. So we want this rectangle to start at zero, which is down here. Um, and then we want it to end at 25. And we want it to start at zero for the Y and end at 25. So it should draw a box right on top of this corner there. Um, I then filled it with, I think this is green. And then I made it semi-transparent so you can actually see the points. If I didn't make this transparent, there would just be a green box on top of everything and you wouldn't be able to see anything. Um, and then we do the same thing. We're going to add a box up in this corner that starts at 150, ends at 175. So that means it's going to start here, end there. So it should fill that box right there. So if we plot it, we should see all of our text annotations and the rectangle annotations. So we have a green box and we have an orange box. So these are the least emitting countries and the most emitting countries. But we also want to make it more obvious what those are so we can add some text on here and some arrows that point at these boxes here to explain better what's going on. So first we're going to add the text. Oh, so let me grab those text annotate layers. So notice how we just keep piling on new annotation layers here. Um, and it's going to get even longer than this, which is fine. It's going to be a very detailed annotated graph, which is cool. Um, here we're going to add another text layer. We're going to put it at 40 and 6. The way I figured that out is I looked down here and I said I want the text to start roughly here. And I chose 6 because the outliers improving starts at 6. And for the sake of alignment, I want both of those things to share the same alignment. I don't want one of these to be slightly up a little bit higher because that breaks the crap design principles. We want it to be down at exactly the same level. And so that will plot and then it's going to make it green as well to match that same green there and the second annotation it's also the same idea um, we have an x and a y so this is going to be at 162.5 the reason i chose that is because that's right in between 150 and 175 um, that's the halfway point and so the text is going to start halfway <clears throat> right in the middle of our box um, and i chose y 135 because it's like here-ish. Um, to make it so it's centered within that orange box, I changed this H just to be 0 0.5, which means centered. So this one's going to be left aligned because it's 0. Um, had I set this to 1, then that would be right aligned, but 0.5 means it's going to be exactly centered. Um, and so now if we run it, we should get some text. It's thinking... There we go. So here's our lowest emitters, and there's our highest emitters. Um, this text right here breaks the principle of proximity because it's not really close to our square, and neither is that one. 
And I did that on purpose because I actually want to draw an arrow starting roughly where that L is and pointing at that green box and starting an arrow where that lowercase h is and pointing up to that box. Um, and then that will help with proximity because then it'll tie these two things together. So the way you do arrows in ggplot is it's once again an annotation layer. So you use annotate. So we will add a plus sign and add some more layers here. The geom that you use for arrows is geom segment, which is just a line segment that we're drawing on the plot. So we have to feed it an x value and an x end value, and then a y and a y end value. The only way I know that is because I looked at the help file for geom segment, and it has a list of the required aesthetics. And so to draw a line, you need x and x end. Um, to draw a rectangle, you need x min, x max, y min, y max. Um, I don't have that memorized. It was just in the documentation. So check that and you'll find stuff there. Um, we're going to make this little line segment be the same color. That's that green. And then there's a special argument here called arrow, where we can add an arrow point or an arrowhead to one of the ends of our line. And you have to use this special function called arrow. And if you look at the documentation for it, it gives an explanation of what all these things are. You can change the angle. Um, if you do like a 45 degree angle, then the arrow is going to be like this. If you do like an 80 degree angle, the arrow is mostly going to be flat. If you do like a 15 degree angle, then it's going to be much more narrow. So here I chose 15 just because. And then the length of the arrow is how long the arrowheads are. And so you can have it be really short or you can have it be really long. Here we're telling it to be half a line long. A line is really just a the measurement that ggplot uses internally to measure distances between things. Um, I only settled on 0.5 lines because one didn't look good and you just experiment with different numbers until it looks okay. Um, and then we add a second segment annotation um, to line up with the center of here and point up at that box. Um, and so I got the, the x end and the y and the y end to all line up and then it also has an arrow. So if we run this now, we should get that. So now we have a green arrow pointing in that connects that lowest emitter section. We have the highest emitter section pointing up, and that looks really cool. So it's working. Um, so a couple other things we can do. We're mostly there with this plot. There is There are some tiny little details that we need to worry about. Um, going back to the, the lecture today about fretting the small stuff, one thing I don't like about this plot is that there's this extra space here between zero and the edge of the y-axis here. No points ever go there and no points ever go here. We kind of have this border thing around the plot area. We can get rid of that. Um, and I'll scroll up above the annotates because I typically like to keep all of the scales and stuff in the same place. Um, the way you do this is with scale x continuous or scale y continuous. One of the arguments here is called expand. And that's what controls kind of the spacing, like the border within the plot, basically, or the margin within the plot. And so if we set that to expand equals 0 and 0, um, and we'll do that for both the x-axis and the y-axis, that will make it so 0 and like starts right in the very corner, and the 0 starts right in the, ver in the corner there. And the other thing we do with the, the scales here is we want to have more numbers down along the side here. We don't want 0, 50, 100, 150. Um, I want numbers at 25 and 75 and 125 as well. So if we look up here, I'm, with the breaks argument, I'm telling it to add those, those uh, breaks there, starting at 0, going to 175, skipping every 25 numbers. And so that's that sequence function that we've been using when we looked at, at regression. So it's going to generate a list of numbers starting at 0, and then 25, 50, 75, 100, etc. And it's going to do that for both the x and the y axis. So look at this plot. Remember how there's this margin here. And now we have 0, 50, 100, 150. If I run this now, that margin should go away, and we should have tick marks every 25 places. So now the plot starts right at 0 and 0. There's no margin, and it goes from 0 to 125, or 175. And the nice thing about that is it makes our little boxes line up directly with the edge of the plot um, instead of kind of floating around in the plot. And that looks cool.
So that's working. A um, couple other minor things we can change. We can get rid of both of these legends because we're going to do something to make it so we don't actually need the legend. Because um, the only colors we have here, like we know that orange applies to this area, green applies to that area. They're not even in the legend, so that doesn't matter. Um, in the subtitle of this plot, we're going to make it so it says that red points have worsening ranks and blue points have better ranks. So we can get rid of the legend because we're not going to actually be using it. So if we do a plus sign, we'll add this layer here, the guides layer, to get rid of the fill legend and the color legend. And so now the plot is bigger, the legend is gone, that looks nice. Um, so the final thing we're going to do here is we are going to add some labels and some theme tweaks. So we'll add the labels first, which I will just grab from here. We're going to use plus and put this here. Um, before I do the subtitle, though, because I don't want to show you that magic trick yet, um, I'm going to switch this to just say CO2. So if I run this now, it should have some nicer plot labels now. It should give an actual label for an actual title, so changes in CO2 emission rankings. And now we have a source down there. It says that we uh, excluded countries that were small. And so that's a lot cleaner. We can, we can um, interpret this a lot better. Um, one thing I don't like if we're talking about the tiny details is the two here in CO2 needs to be a subscript. It needs to be lower down um, because it's like a chemistry formula. And so we need to somehow get that two to go down. And that um, prior to like a few months ago, that was impossible in, um, in ggplot unless you did some fancy tricks to make it uh, treat it as math. Um, but what we can actually do is if we add a theme layer, so if you remember, we loaded a package up here called ggText. What ggText lets you do, one, thing, one reason why it's super magic, is it lets you basically use HTML in your text, and then it will render it as, um, as the way it should look in HTML. So there's an HTML tag called sub for subscript, and it makes, um, text subscripted and so when you have, if you ever look at wikipedia and look at chemistry formulas or anything with like a subscript you know math formula or something that has an sub tag wrapped around it and that's what makes it drop down so if we come up to our title and if we type um, a subscript tag which is this uh, bracket um, sub and then the closing tag is bracket slash sub so that's the HTML code for making a subscripted number or a subscripted anything. Anything in between those two tags will be lower down. Um, right now, if we just run this, it will put that actual text in, which we don't really want. Yeah, changes in CO2, sub2, sub emissions. That's ugly. We don't want that to happen. What theme or what the ggText package lets us do is you're already familiar with, um, like if you want to manipulate one of the text-based things in a plot, you use element underscore text. Um, what we can do instead is we can say plot.title. Instead of element text, we're going to use something called element markdown, which will parse any HTML and any markdown that we use in the title. So all we have to do is say element markdown here. And what that will do is it will change that sub tag into an actual subscript. And it will do that for any other markdown that we include. So look, now we have changes in CO2 emission rankings. Um, any markdown will work, or most markdown will work. So if we want like emission to be bold, um, we can put two asterisks around it because that's how you do bold in markdown. So now if I run it, it should have the subscripted too, but it should also make emissions be bold. And let's see if it worked. It did. Changes in CO2 emission rankings. Um, we probably don't want that to be bold in real life. Um, just that one word, so we can take off those. But that was just to show you, like, it, it parses the, H, the HTML and the markdown that's in the text. This element markdown tells it to do that. It won't do it to every text element. You, just, you have to tell it which things to turn markdown on inside. 
Um, the other element text options will work inside element markdown. So if we want to make that whole title be bold, we can say um, face equals bold. And if we want the whole title to be bigger, we can say size equals, and then if you remember from a week ago, we had REL, which means it'll change it relative to whatever the base size was. So we can do like 1.6 times whatever the base size is. So we should have a slightly bigger title that is all bold with the superscripted two or the subscripted two. Um, it is going off the plot here. That's okay. That's because I'm really zoomed in. Um, and because like when you actually export this using GG save or whatever, you can choose whatever dimensions you want. And so you can make it really big or, or do whatever to make it fit. So I'm not super concerned that it's, it's off the page here. Okay. So that looks cool. The next thing we want to do is we want to make a subtitle explain what the red and the blue mean. And we can use that same approach, that same element markdown approach using a type of HTML. So if we paste this in here, what's happening with the subtitle here is you'll notice I actually used HTML directly in the text here. The span tag is just a, an HTML tag that means wrap, it just wraps some text with the span and then we're telling it to be colored with a specific color. That's the same green color or blue color that we're using here. And then I use these two asterisks to make improved be bold. And then I wrap worsened in an HTML tag and tell it to be red um, and then also be bolded. So if we run this code now, the subtitle should have text that is colored and bolded directly in it, but not quite. So the reason it's not, so it, it put the HTML in there, but that's just like raw HTML. The reason that didn't work is because we have to tell ggplot to treat that subtitle as markdown. So we say plot.subtitle equals element markdown. And if we just do that, it should do it. So now instead of showing those raw HTML tags that are ugly, it actually bolds it and it actually colors it. This was impossible a few months ago. There was no way to kind of get colors directly into text like that. Um, this is like way exciting. The only way that you could do this in the past was export this figure into Illustrator and then add your own caption and do all of the coloring by yourself in Illustrator. But now you can do it directly in ggplot. Um, and that is like super cool and mind blowing here. Um, so that's, that's so cool. Yay, element markdown. Um, cool. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this, this gray background and we're going to change the fonts to make it nicer instead of this default Arial font. So to do that, I can just add a theme layer. I need to add it before these other theme layers so that it doesn't override any of those things that we added. And then I'm going to change the base family to this IBM Plex Sans font, which is a free font from Google Fonts. Um, you can download it there. It's a nice font. Um, nice sensor font. So now if I run it, we should have a beautiful picture in a nice font. Yeah. So there's our IBM Plex font and the subtitles there and everything else is there. The only thing that did not work is the fonts for our annotations. The theme, setting the theme font right here, like this base family, it works for all of the geom layers and all of the, the labs elements, but it doesn't actually do anything to the labels themselves, which is slightly annoying. Um, you have to do that for each of the annotation layers. We have to tell it to use IBM Plex Sans. So this is still Arial and that's still Arial. And so that's not great. So the way you're officially supposed to do it is if we come up to any of these and the text layers here, um, what we have to do is we have to specify the font family. So we say family equals IBM Plex Sans. That's what it's called, right? Yep, IBM Plex Sans. So our outliers improving label should use the correct font now. So if we run it, we should see just the outliers improving, that uses our better font. You can tell with the G, it has this little serif um, flippy-uppy thing on the G, but the Arial does not. 
So this one label worked. So if we want the other things to be all labeled with the right font, one way to do it is to come up here and copy family, e family equals IBM Plex Sans, copy it and paste it inside all of our text annotate layers and paste it inside Geom Label Repel and then it will work. But that is exceedingly tedious. You don't want to actually do that um, because then if you want to change the font to something else, you have to make sure that you go through and change every single instance of it on all of your annotate layers and that is miserable. So to make it a little bit easier, there is a function in ggplot called update geom defaults. And what we can do here is we can tell it to make every single text geom that we use, use specific settings. So if we want all of our text to be red, we could say color equals red. If we want all of our text to use the same font family, we can say family equals IBM Plex Sans. And so if I run this, what it will do now is any geom layer that uses text, such as all of these annotate layers, um, they will now use IBM Plex Sans automatically. Um, that will not get the labels because that's a separate geom. And so what we need to do is copy this and change it so that the label geom, so anytime we're plotting a label, it will also use IBM Plex Sans. That still won't get this guy um, because this is a separate geom, this is label repel. So we need to duplicate this again. So we need to say label underscore repel. So now any repelled labels will automatically be IBM Plex Sans as well. So if we run these three lines, and now if we plot it, and we scroll down, everything on there now is using IBM Plex Sans. Um, we have a nice title that is big. We have actual colored text in the subtitle, which is like amazing. And we've got all sorts of annotations here and we can tell some fun and exciting stories um, with this heavily annotated plot. Um, and so that's kind of a, a basic walkthrough of this fairly complicated code that is um, filtering this data and reshaping it. And now we just have all these annotations to help the reader understand what's going on. And this is like publication worthy right here. This could be on an official website for like 538 or the Washington Post or something. This looks cool. Um, and you can do this stuff now. And so that is how you use annotation layers and improve things and do all sorts of cool text styling with R and ggplot. So have fun with your exercises. You'll get to do nothing this complicated, but um, if you want to, go right ahead. Go as wild as you want with these annotations and have fun.